I'm speaking with you today about the global crisis we face. Many have addressed this predicament. There have been many prophecies, omens, warnings, calls to wake up and create change. What I hope to bring to you today is another perspective on this, this moment in humanity's evolution. The intelligence of the heart once again rule the nations of humanity. Globally, we have never been more aware of the, the collective joys, successes, failures, trials, tribulations, traumas, travesties, destruction, oppression, control, and greed. That is part of the human experience. There's a lot to celebrate and there are so many injustices, so many completely destructive realities that have somehow become normal. One thing that is not new is the root cause of suffering. For millennia, many have been ruled by individuals with thirst for power, greed ruling the heart, those who believe they deserve life and luxury and others deserve pain, suffering and death. Those who no longer hold life as sacred and those who are living in sin, but somehow ruling nations of people. Those who believe they are better than others, desiring to conquer and gain power over others. Those who are ignorant of the ultimate truth. And there are those who ignore all these problems because they are getting something out of it. I look up out the window, I see a clear blue sky. The sun is shining on the leaves of these majestic trees. The beauty of creation fills my heart. For a moment, I'm transported and forget the overwhelming pain of the now. For a moment, I forget this world where hate and fear appears to have more control of the hearts of humanity than love. In moments, we are reminded that peace, joy, and love are possible. What gives one hope for humanity? How many people have you met who no longer believe that humanity can overcome these destructive paths, these ways and uh, paths of abusing power? Did you know that in the United States that middle-aged white males account for the highest suicide rate. In 2018, for example, it was almost 70% of all suicides. Why would the most privileged people be the highest rate of suicide? In this country, we've been taught this path of success in life that's rooted in me first. You get your own good job, you got your house, you got your car, you got your big screen, you got all your stuff, right? Um, but how much do we see clearly that there remains a profound inner void and emptiness because maybe we are all connected. If the world was ending in chaos, hiding in the basement with ample food, would that bring you joy while the rest of the people were dying? I've been seeking a reason to have hope some way to get perspective on this beautiful and repulsive chaos of life on earth. And I've come to a place where I do have hope and I know that love will win. I have been searching my whole adult life for the last 30 years for answers to questions that for most of my life um, I wasn't really satisfied with the answers I was getting. Uh, and, and here's what I've learned. Here's the pieces for me that fit together this puzzle. I have a lot of individuals to thank who have helped me come to this place of awareness. This perspective is primarily a weaving of evolutionary astrology teachings of Jeffrey Whip Green, combined with Sri Teshwar's teachings of the yugas. I'm also thankful to Darlene Tate, 
who was the one who introduced me to the teachings of Yogananda and Sri Yukteswar. And through conversations with Darlene, helped me realize the age of Aquarius could have a lot of dark sides to it. And also it became apparent through our conversations that the modern crisis correlates to the culmination of the Virgo subage. If we take the concept of the yugas to be true, we have this concept that humanity's consciousness is like the tides, moving uh, away from and returning to this awareness of ultimate truth. Within the yugas, the point where humanity is furthest from awareness of true nature, of its true nature and the source, the point of greatest separation from source and spirit is at the end of the descending Kali Yuga. There are various teachings about when this actually occurred. Sri Yukteswar taught uh, that this point was approximately around 550 as a common era, the center of the Kali Yuga. <clears throat> this is a 24,000 year cycle, these Yugas. Uh, so just 12,000 years ago, um, from, from 550 at least, right? Uh, here, here's a, a Sri Yukteswar quote. Dharma, the mental virtue, becomes so much developed that human can easily comprehend all, even the mysteries of spirit. Like I said, that would have been about 11,500 BCE approximately. Uh, seeing this cycle, perhaps you can imagine that the descent into the Kali Yuga and the karma of the Kali Yuga playing out thereafter correlates to the ignorance in the world we face, a phenomena humanity would have faced previously, cyclically. Thus, this loss of faith in humanity to live with virtue and lead by the intelligence of the heart in this now has come and gone before. So, in a sense, we're not in a new predicament. However, the modern conditions of reality and new combination of circumstances and conditions provide a new landscape for a familiar human drama. Jeffrey Wolf Green taught that the start of patriarchal culture on earth was during the Capricorn sub-age of the Cancer Age. And so in context to the yugas taught by Sri Yukteswar, we see that this occurred as the descending Treta Yuga was unfolding. Uh, Jeffrey Wolf Green taught that previously to this moment, uh, conception and pregnancy were part of the mystery of life. And um, at this time, men realized that they had the ability to control the inception of life, pregnancy and lineage. And with this awareness, the desire to control life settled into the hearts of some men falling into the temptation of this potential power. This is my understanding of, of what he taught. Um, and the rest was um, a progressive spread of patriarchal culture, raping and pillaging, forcing humanity into cycles of violence, eye for an eye, war ruled the nations. An interesting side note, gruesome but interesting. Um, the descending Kali Yuga saw the Iron Age, which also coincided with the age of Aries, which was overlapping with the Neptune Pluto conjunctions in Aries. And perhaps sometime uh, I'll be able to talk about that a little bit more. Still, I have gone back to asking why. Why would humanity fall into this? Why hurt and destroy? Why kill and control? What ignorance is this? I mean, when the USA went from a manhunt for Osama bin Laden to suddenly bombing Iraq, there was mass support. I didn't see the church take a moral stand against this in mass. Would Jesus have decided to bomb Iraq? Would Jesus support mass incarceration, white supremacists in uniform continuing to hunt and kill the black man? Still, I go back to what happened. Why? 
can I accept this cycle of ignorance and awareness of humanity? A larger ebb and flow of consciousness. It doesn't make anything right or okay, but I have hope that we are not always going to be ignorant. It's a cycle. We will return to this awareness only to fall into ignorance <laughs> over and over. That's life. This is a cycle of evolution within humanity. Perhaps it is. Back to the now. Is it the age of Aquarius? Is it the age of Pisces? I firmly believe that, which I foreshadowed earlier, we are in the Virgo sub-age of the Pisces age and transitioning. We're transi at the transition point, transitioning into the age of Aquarius. Uh, and there, at this time right now, there's a lot of planetary phenomena that are heralding the age of Aquarius. Just uh, for example, I, this is a chart I used for the start of the World Wide Web. It was when a proposal was put forward, um, basically. Um, and uh, you can see, basically, this is the, the 1990 conjunction of, of Uranus and Neptune in Capricorn. And that was one planetary phenomenon that, that heralded this transition into the age of Aquarius. This winter solstice, we have this great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, first degree of Aquarius, which we will, astrologers have been talking about a lot for a while. It's also, while Jupiter and Saturn were in an air sign conjunction in Libra in 1980, 40 years ago, this one marks the next 200 years of these Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions in air signs. Aquarius is an air sign. This one is in Aquarius. So we have another planetary phenomena heralding this age of Aquarius in. Uh, here, this chart is the Pluto Aquarius ingress, January 20th, 2024. Um, uh, Pluto does uh, dip its toes into the waters of Aquarius uh, in 2023 for a little bit. This is the official, I'm here to stay in Aquarius for a while chart. Uh, this chart here is the, um, the United States chart at its third Uranus return. And um, one of the reasons I'm showing this, which you're going to see here in a minute, is uh, shortly after this Uranus return, Uranus transits its own north node in Gemini while Pluto is in Aquarius. So we've got a lot of things that are stacking up that are, that are kind of accelerating this transition into the age of Aquarius during the decade of the 2020s. Um, this chart here is, um, there you can see um, in the fourth house, uh, even the houses are meaningless in this chart, but uh, this is uh, in 2028 when Uranus is conjunct its own north node heliocentric nodal positions there listed. Venus is right next door. Also, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. We've got the heliocentric north nodes of Uranus and Venus in a conjunction in Gemini. Well, if you look up when the age of Aquarius actually began, uh, there's a lot of different uh, dates, <laughs> a lot of different systems, right? Um, I, I found some dates that the age of Pisces ends in 1989, 1994, a couple systems said 2012. There's a 2150, a 2654, and a 2680. Um, I remember Jeffrey Wolf Green saying this joke that we're not just going to wake up one day and be like, oh, it's the age of Aquarius. Uh, so it is a gradual transition into this. <clears throat> And we're going to get back to a little bit more of that in a second. But uh, I wanted to turn our attention back to this Virgo subage, which we're still in. So we've got that we're in this transition. There's all these Aquarian themes that just keep coming and coming more and more. And yet, there's a lot that we can see going on that 
reflect the Virgo subage that's culminating. And this is a very important to give us context for the now. In evolutionary astrology, Virgo correlates to crisis. So we've got a whole thousand year era Virgo subage representing a very large crisis within humanity. If you don't really buy into this whole subage thing, uh, just look at the turn in the linea and thereafter seeking pronounced themes of masochism, sadism, and the whole spectrum in between. The progressive embedding into the collective psyche that there's something wrong with me, the potential humbling effect of realizing our own egocentric imperfections has gone full blown into being unworthy, undeserving. I deserve suffering, inner lacking, inner spiritual void, gross overt forms of humiliating others with torture of various kinds. These are all Virgonian themes in a negative sense. <clears throat> the Northwest University Press's Lessons and Legacies, Volume 8, uh, discussed that there was a very distinct rise of monastic self-flagellation right around the turn of millennia. Uh, it happened to reach an extreme in the 13th century. There was a Roman Catholic cult known as the Flagellates. That's probably saying that wrong, excuse me. Uh, in the modern world, over and over, I see this Virgo inner crisis. Over and over, not believing in ourselves, not believing in the value of who we are, of what we offer. It's overwhelmingly apparent from staying in abusive relationships, to not deserving better, to the extreme sadistic lash out anger response of any mention of flaw or imperfection or mistake. This dynamic, of course, is twisted with themes of Piscean victim consciousness, savior complexes, and martyrdom. Pisces in polarity to Virgo represents a simplicity, a wholeness, a unity, total acceptance. Virgo gone to the extreme of negative manifestation. We see the list that is too long. We get dizzy trying to do all the things. We never succeed in getting ahead. But how does the conditions of this larger reality play into this. Life has become so intricately complex. Virgo, subage. Most people have reached a max capacity of what they can handle, what they can take in. And people need a Piscean break from the ongoing crises of life. Do we get a break? Is it enough? Do individuals have their own Virgonian true work in life, meaningful work? with the reward of social recognition for its valuable contribution to the whole. If you work at a factory that's making plastic Santas, does that provide that? Does making phone calls for a corporation give you this? The modern crisis of the overwhelmingly complex meaninglessness of this moment we have created, seeming to now go on its own accord crisis of the momentum of progress as the separation from the natural world and our ancestral roots goes further and further. Right now I notice um, quite a few people uh, are doing the Pisces, you know, Neptune's in Pisces, right? And so, um, yeah, there is a lot of checking out for sure. Um, I've talked to people, you know, with drastically different views on the world who are just like, I don't watch the news anymore. I just you know, and uh, uh, like I said, everyone does need a Piscean break and a simplification and a return to wholeness of being. Uh, are our breaks medicine? Are they coping? Are they habits? Are they addictions? Is it good or bad? Um, we answer to the reflection in the looking glass. What we see right now with us being at the end of this Jupiter-Saturn cycle, 
facing social, political, economic breakdowns. There's even more checking out. Reality has become uh, increasingly overwhelming and hard to face for many. The struggle to keep going when you've lost everything. This is very real for even more people right now. The balsamic Jupiter Saturn cycle continues until December 21st, 2020 at that conjunction we were just talking about. And relative to Neptune and Pisces, do we stay conscious or check out? Got this Mars and Aries for the rest of the year, right? Uh, there's this call to fight for freedom, for independence, for what we need. Um, what are we fighting for? Um, remember, Aries evolves through its polarity Libra. So uh, it is a time for action, of course, but beware of pure reaction and anger response without the capacity to, to listen. Can we still listen to each other? Many of you are aware that the USA is heading towards its Pluto return. Pluto, obviously, uh, rules Scorpio, represents evolution and devolution, death and birth. Uh, we're in the balsamic phase of this conjunction, or I'm, not, I'm sorry, not conjunction, but we're the balsamic phase of this Pluto cycle for the nation began in the year 2000, and it goes till December of 2022. And so uh, right now we're in the, the last throes of the balsamic phase, we're, we're getting really close, right? To that, to the end of the cycle, uh, which is intensifying the death of the nation before the symbolic rebirth, which really kicks off in 2023. So this now is very much amplified 2020, a year of breakdown because of the synchronicity, the balsamic Jupiter Saturn cycle uh, on top of this balsamic Pluto return. <clears throat> uh, at the birth of the country, we've been taught over and over this pride around the spirit of the American Revolution. We've been indoctrinated through our schools. <laughs> uh, it's changing a bit, but uh, there's this taught thing here in the States that to be revolutionary was patriotic and inspired ideas of freedom and human rights filled the air, spirit of the American Revolution. Of course, we know that this was very hypocritical in a lot of ways, simultaneous practices of slavery, genocide of Native Americans, feminine was devalued and depowered in countless ways, and many other injustices. But uh, nonetheless, there was definitely a clear spirit of revolution during this time. And I want to emphasize this because the birth of the nation, we saw Uranus and Gemini, uh, and it was applying to conjunct its own nor north node. And um, actually, if you look at the, at the US chart, uh, the midpoint between Uranus and Mars in the US chart is, is right on that Uranus north node. So, so we have this very highlighted here. Uh, as Venus was transiting in Gemini this spring, you remember that? Venus did its whole retrograde. It spent a long time in Gemini. It had a triple pass over the north node of Uranus. And of course, the heliocentric north node of Venus, this conjunction, got very activated um, this spring. <clears throat> so, um, so we had the start of this sweeping revolutionary spirit, Uranus and Gemini. Uh, uh, also, like Saturn was in Aquarius for a moment there, and um, you know we we saw a whole whole lot of global global uprising, a spirit of revolution. Um, of course, this was sparked off by the video of the murder of George Floyd. Um, while we're in the death of a nation process, we're going to see more and more sparks of revolution that's coming. My friend and colleague, Michael Kiyoshi, uh, has talked to me numerous times about 
the correlation between the Uranus cycle and the US chart. And I'm just gonna go over the, the three Uranus returns for the US here in a second. And uh, what I added to this conversation was that that Uranus return for the US is, is extra potent because it's transiting our own North Node, its own North Node, excuse me, um, and the North Node of Venus and Gemini. So at the start, we had this, you know, nation begin with a sweeping revolutionary spirit, Uranus was in Gemini. So why would Uranus and Gemini have that flair? Well, I think that this is one reason why. And of course, Pluto was in Capricorn then. Now, um, Pluto in Aquarius, shortly after the birth of nation would, would have um, correlated to the French Revolution. So I'm just gonna jump forward here to the first Uranus return. And um, this first Uranus return for the USA was Civil War. April 12th, 1861 chart here. Um, jumping ahead, second Uranus return. This chart actually was bombing of Pearl Harbor. US got pulled, pulled into World War II, so to speak. Um, this is ju happened just prior to Uranus crossing the Gemini Ascendant. This is also, by the way, this is the USA chart that we use in evolutionary astrology, of Jeffrey of Green, uh, slightly different than other charts uh, as far as the time. So yeah, so, um, so you can see that World War II uh, experience was another Uranus and Gemini for the country. Uh, and here we go, we've got our third Uranus return, that's coming up in 2027. This is an exact hit on July 25th. And this time, Pluto will be in Aquarius. And look at that conjunct our south node. Okay. Uh, so we've got this Jupiter Saturn conjunction in Aquarius this winter that's sparking off this whole incoming wave of revolution, just like this. Venus retrograde, triple pass over these Gemini planetary north nodes, uh, simultaneous with Saturn's first appearance in Aquarius, did this spring of 2020. That was some of the first sparks. It's just, this is just the start, that's what I'm saying. This is, this is we've got a whole decade and beyond. Things are, things are just getting going. Um, here's the chart for Pluto's ingress into Aquarius. Uh, and we know that um, Pluto pops in for a little bit in 2023, but this chart here is when Pluto's like, okay, I'm in Aquarius and I'm here to stay, you know. Um, so this is, that, that was uh, uh, most of the significant planetary events heralding this coming revolution and, and the progressive transition into the age of Aquarius, you can see. <clears throat> Um, I've heard uh, for a long time that the television, the, the revolution will not be televised. Uh, however, it seems that perhaps television is the revolution or uh, more specifically, the ability for any one person to capture a photo or video, a human experience, and then share that with the whole world in the same day, right? Technology has this potential for revolution, but is there gonna be free access to the information? And that, that opens up a whole discussion about technology as it relates to humanity, revolution of the next decade, and ways that those who have power right now and the resources use, abuse, manipulate, and control access to information and technology. Just think about it for a second. We've got the North Node of Venus and Uranus conjunct in Gemini. I mean, what says freedom of information like this conjunction, right? Uh, have you ever heard of SpaceX? So this is the chart for when SpaceX was, was founded. Um, an Elon Musk company that um, has a mission of getting to Mars. Um, but there's a lot more going on with this company too. Sure, it's crazy. I mean, 
look at all those things in Gemini there, um, Venus, Saturn, Mars, the North Node, that's all on these North Nodes of, of Uranus and Venus and Gemini. It's pretty interesting. Also, uh, it's interesting with Pluto's right on the South Node in that chart too. Um, so um, SpaceX has a, a satellite constellation they're launching called Starlink. Maybe you've heard of this by now. Here's a quote from Wiki. SpaceX intends to provide satellite internet connectivity to underserved areas of the planet, as well as provide competitively priced service to urban areas. The company has stated that the positive cash flow from selling satellite internet services would be necessary to fund their Mars plans. SpaceX also plans to sell some of the satellites for military, scientific, or exploratory purposes, end quote. The whole Starlink constellation is gonna consist of about 42,000 low earth orbit satellites. Somewhat interesting number, 42 is half, you know, half of your on a cycle in earth years. Interesting. Uh, but you know, like I hear this and I'm like, what? What deals are in the works and have already been made uh, that let uh, the authorities of the nations today uh, let a private company, you know, launch forty-two thousand satellites into our atmosphere? It's kind of mind blowing. I didn't consent to that. Um, the estimated completion date for that is in the year 2027, which we just saw. It's the time that Uranus is transiting all these Gemini points here. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, as we progress onward, further into this transition towards Age of Aquarius, it is easier and easier to see that um, there are a lot of dark sides that the Age of Aquarius is going to bring with it. You know, perhaps all these dystopian futuristic novels are like just foreshadowing, you know, of, of what, what we got coming. Um, so, seems as though the wealthiest people in the world have already had their deals in place. And, uh, you know, there's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide, tracking everything, all that data for what? Why? Did you know that China already has an estimated 626 million facial recognition surveillance cameras? Hong Kong has fallen. The stage is being set for the revolution. The powers that be have been several steps ahead, most of us, to keep a stronghold on the potential of us having a revolution to create egalitarian societies, the true social security. I mean, we've got the north nodes of Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto, all in Cancer, creating egalitarian societies with true social security is what the planets speak to. And of course, freedom of information, north nodes of Venus and Uranus conjunct in Gemini. Can you feel that? This coming growing swell, global call for freedom of information and providing social security. Police officers acting like they're on a military siege, heavily weaponized and ready to open fire, killing unarmed civilians. There is no security in this. In the United States, since President Trump changed the asylum rules in 2019, the refugee crisis for our neighbors to the south of Mexico is one of the worst on the planet. There is no social security for these people. We as a country media-wise more or less ignore this entirely while attention is diverted. What hypocritical behavior ignoring one of the worst humanitarian crises on the planet while pretending to help nations all over the world 
our many military bases. It's as if we care more about Turkey, but we won't touch an organized crime that runs the north half of Mexico. The planets are calling for social security to restructure societies so that you are safe and secure to, to walk to the store, to drive down the road, to be cared for when you're suffering, to just be you without fear of being attacked. A nation built upon each person having to be out for their self first is destined to fail. People will suffer, chaos will reign in the dark night of the soul. USA Pluto return, death of a nation. It's happening. I pray that the rebirth embodies the path the planets are pointing us toward. Evil finds a way to twist all things. Humanity is still deep in its own ignorance. How much more violence and suffering, killing need to happen before we wake up and change our ways? It could be lifetimes, but according to the spiritual giants, we will collectively return to this alignment with source and awareness of a higher path of virtue. Regardless of anything, only I can bring myself inner joy, peace, and happiness. Only you can do this for yourself. The Taurus path to Pisces for your own salvation, the value is in your effort. Uh, now I'm gonna jump in, I've got, I've got a little time left here. Um, so we're gonna look at a few charts that were presented as example charts. And if you can't see the top of the slide, the first column is the south node and the second column is the north node. So what I wanted to do with these charts was maybe provide something that I, that I get when I look at a chart that maybe some of you um, don't think of or are, are just learning to think about it, charts in these ways, you know, and I think because we all approach charts in our own way, we all offer a, a unique, helpful way of, of getting, getting into a chart, right? Uh, so I'm just going to throw out a couple kernels, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about is how I, when I start to look at charts, and I add all of the planetary nodes in there too, uh, you see themes. And one of the hard things to do is um, learn how to synthesize the archetypes and understand the, the dominant themes. So um, just going to throw out some things here. So for example, um, on this chart of Danielle, the, the north node is in Scorpio. So uh, the planetary ruler of that north node is Pluto, right? And Pluto is in a conjunction with the Sun and Mercury in Libra. So that all of that, the ruler and all the three of those planets then are ruled by Venus and Virgo. So for me then, there is this extra emphasis on that Venus and Virgo and what that means. So if you look at the planetary nodes, the north node of Venus, I'm pretty sure it's right, right just into Virgo, but I didn't have the exact time and I didn't verify it that it had entered. So um, that person can, can check that for themselves, but um, let's go with that. The, so that's a conjunct the natal Venus in Virgo. So immediately we're like, okay, Venus is conjunct her own north node in Virgo. So there's an extra emphasis there. <clears throat> um, that's one thing I just, you know, like you're looking for correlations, like what in this person's life correlates to these symbols. And in this case, there's even more emphasis of developing that Venus uh, as it relates to the ruler of Pluto, which rules the North Node, and it's on its own North Node, right? So you kind of like, you're tuning into that. That's an important point. What's going on there? Um, another thing I noticed in this chart that you'll find somewhat interesting is the, 
the nodes of Mars and the natal Mars is this trinity of Mars, right? So the, the south node of Mars is at six Scorpio in the 11th house. It's in an air house, water sign Scorpio. The natal Mars is in the sign of Gemini in the seventh house, air, air, right? And then the north node of Mars also in the seventh house, also very close to the, the natal Mars, but in Cancer. And so there's a very strong air theme with that Mars, but also um, I, I call it like water of air. So there's bringing this uh, water equality into the realm of air and being called to do that. Uh, and so, you know, having, again, having the natal Mars and the north node of Mars both in the seventh house, uh, it's something to get into. Like, what does that mean? What is that north node of Mars at the first degree of cancer in the seventh house about? You know, what, what securities need to be developed in bringing forward and sharing information? Uh, so just a few ways that I, things that I saw when I, when I looked at that chart. Um, and also, you know, based on what we all just talked about, you can see that series in Gemini in the seventh house is indeed conjunct that um, north nodes of, of Uranus and Venus. Um, well, definitely the north node of Uranus, heliocentric and 17 geocentric. Um, so <clears throat> we've got time for a little more here on this chart. Um, so, you know, obviously one thing that jumps out really strongly is the past of where the soul's coming from. Pluto's in the 11th house. We've got that south node in Aquarius conjunct Venus. And then that's ruled by Uranus, which is conjunct the moon. Uh, so there's, there's very strong Aquarian, Uranian archetypal theme to the past, right? And of course, the question would be like, well, you know, I mean, what's the evolutionary stage? How, how did that, regardless, someone who's individuating and um, we know a lot of the themes that that, that would be bringing up. Um, something I wanted to, to, to draw attention to was if we go to the North Node in, in Leo, that's going to be, the Sun, of course, is going to be the ruler of the North Node. Now the sun's at 22 Capricorn, conjunct Mercury. And so the sun is, is very much right between the south nodes of Saturn and Pluto. And it's opposite Juno and Cancer. And Juno and Cancer in the eighth house is conjunct those north nodes of Saturn and Pluto and Cancer. So we have this whole, and Pluto happens to be square, this whole axis, right? So that, that T-square right there is pretty significant in this chart. And if you don't plug in those nodes of, of Saturn and Pluto, you don't really realize um, how much that plays a role in, in, this, in this chart and what that all means. Um, so I'm just gonna jump ahead and leave you at, with that on that one uh, in Laura's chart the ruler of the north node, north node being in Capricorn in the sixth house. We've got the ruler is Saturn. Saturn's at 20 Scorpio. Happens to be in a very nice trine to Jupiter in Cancer. And um, Jupiter at 20 degrees Cancer, of course, is conjunct the north nodes again. Of, of Saturn and, and Pluto, Uranus is right there. It's all in the twelfth. So, so that tie into those North nodes uh, is really interesting. And if you think about um, Jupiter in its correlation to natural law and and laws and judicial systems, and you think about uh, the North nodes of Saturn and Pluto and Cancer as symbols for restructuring society so that there actually is true security for all people. People are cared for and feel safe in society. Uh, and this is in the 12th house. It 
raises the question for me of like, what does that mean for this person? What whole, because 12th house too has that, this holds ultimate meaning in consciousness, laws of that are gonna be put in place that are steps towards this restructuring of society to bring true social security. So you get that, you get a perspective, you get a question, and then you get to correlate that with what this person's been doing in their lives, which I have no idea. Um, but <laughs> I also wanted to point out in this that um, <clears throat> the north nodes of Venus and Mars, if you look there um, at four degrees and two degrees Taurus, so that's a little uh, that Taurus conjunction of the north nodes of Venus and Mars, that's pretty significant um, in the 10th house. Moon also happens to be Taurus in the 10th. Uh, but that nodal conjunction happens to be squaring uh, Chiron in Aquarius in the seventh. So you might not have looked at this chart and thought about that tension, but if you see what does it mean for them to go into that, um, own it, do it themselves, put forth the effort to create their own path in, in their work and their career in the world, and, and how they hold space and stepping into their own authority and, and what tension is that relation to that, that wound of, of, of Chiron and Aquarius in the seventh. There's gonna be some theme and story there. Get to, you get, you get, a, get a lead in with the nodes on that. Uh, last one. Uh, here's Barbara's chart. Uh, we've got the north node of Uranus is um, conjunct her moon in Gemini. So immediately, now that you're very much aware of that hot point in Gemini, I mean, to me, it's just like, you know, I'm not ever going to think about Gemini and not think of the north node of Uranus and Venus in Gemini. It's part of the archetype. It's part of, it's the part of the entire collective experience of that archetype right now. Um, so unless you're transporting yourself to another space and time on the planet and can truly experience what Gemini was like before they were having the north nodes there, it's, it's this other layer to the archetype, right? And, and because of her moon, she's really plugged into that. Mars is right there, it's in the 11th house. Um, so how is that? getting expressed and what does that mean that it's conjunct those north nodes. <clears throat> the, um, the ruler of the north node, north node being Aquarius, of course, would be um, Uranus in this chart. And uh, if you look at Uranus at, at 15 Cancer, you can see that that's uh, very close to that. There's a Saturn-Pluto conjunction over there. Uh, in Cancer at 19. So the, again, there's there. So for Barbara's chart, we have very strong connection to um, this whole Cancer and Gemini themes that the North Nodes are bringing. Um, and again, with just to finish on this note, um, you know, we're looking at these interwoven themes that are part of all humanity. Uh, freedom of information, you know, connected with restructuring societies, create laws, social institutions that support social security for all. Uh, this is a larger backdrop to this. So with, with that, um, that's what I had to offer for today. And uh, if you've made it to the end, thanks for, for tuning in. Till next time. Thanks so much, Bradley. That was fantastic. Oh, thanks.